All right, we are now recording. Welcome everybody to the monthly IPFS local and offline collaboration meetup. It's July 16th. And today we have Evan and Ahmad from the Freedom Pioneers. We're gonna to talk to us about NAPSEC. Please. Sure, uh, let me share my screen first. Uh, so, hi, I uh, hope you are all doing Hello. fine during this. Oh, um, uh, I'm at... yeah. uh, sorry. <laughs> so, I uh, hope you're all doing fine during this pandemic, and thanks to the IPFS community for providing us this opportunity. Uh, I'm Evan Firuzi, technical coordinator of Net Freedom Pioneers, here with Ahmad, uh, my good colleague. Uh, Net Freedom Pioneers uh, is a nonprofit organization with the primary mission of providing tools and partnership to protect the free flow of information. In the past seven, eight years, NFP successfully launched several projects, uh, which amongst them I will mainly talk about Knapsack, uh, Knapsack for Hope and Lisa Protocol, the backbone of Knapsack for Hope. Uh, Knapsack uh, is a satellite file casting service that leverages common satellite equipment to deliver digital content. Uh, this is mainly used for areas that they either don't have uh, reliable internet access or uh, the uh, internet is censored and filtered by the government. Uh, the main idea behind Knapsack was a platform that uh, any non-tech savvy FTA satellite TV audience can use their current satellite setup box and receivers to receive and record files without making any modification on their systems, on their devices, or without any learning curve. Uh, Knapsack users uh, can connect a USB flash drive to a satellite setup box and start recording from their satellite. Uh, but instead of recording videos and uh, along with videos and audios, actually, they're gonna record internet content like files, all sorts of files, binary files, uh, softwares, uh, and so on. Uh, this content is obviously downloaded locally and anonymously. Nobody would know uh, who, who is using this content. Uh, and they can be anywhere uh, that the satellite footprint, uh, footprint coverage uh, covered that, that area. So uh, the, the whole system, the whole configuration is consists of uh, one is the uh, is a server that aggregates index and prefer content for, for send, uh, sending through satellite. Uh, then uh, we have another server that converts these uh, files into a TSS stream and uh, send it to a broadcast location. Uh, then we need to lease a, a channel, a, t a TV channel on a commercial uh, TV satellite. Uh, and on the user side, the only thing they need is a, a setup box that they use to watch TV, a USB flash drive, and a PC or an Android device to uh, extract the data. Uh, the only part that they need to have internet connection in this, this whole process is to download a really a small application, our extractor application, to extract the record, uh, to extract files from the recorded, uh, recorded data from satellite. Uh, Napsack can be uh, broadcasted anywhere. Uh, it, the, the, uh, the coverage of, because it's a satellite, it's similar to a satellite TV, uh, it's, it has a broad continental or regional uh, coverage. Uh, it can be accessed by anyone with any, te any type of technical knowledge or no technical knowledge. Uh, they don't, users don't need to obtain new equipment or uh, they, they don't need to buy any new hardware. They can use what they are using to watch TV. Uh, and obviously it's cost effective for them because it doesn't put any burden on them. On the other hand, it's cost effective for publishers because they can, they can send their content to millions of people at once uh, without being worried about their bandwidth or in their infrastructure. Uh, additional to that, uh, it provides users with a bundle of content, uh, which in a, in a sense, we can refer it to, uh, as, to as, as a magazines of, magazine of files and digital content. Uh, so how this work uh, is actually pretty interesting. Uh, you might ask question that, for example, uh, we had data channels that uh, we were traditionally using to transfer data through satellites. Uh, but uh, 
I, if you've ever used any of those, uh, you needed to have uh, the minimum of technical knowledge. Uh, you needed you needed a PC or a or a MacBook, uh, a DVB card, and uh, all that process is is not a trivial process for for everybody to use. So what we thought about was to make make everything easier. Uh, that I, I'll explain in a little. But uh, the back before before going there, I, I, I'll rather talk about the backbone of Knapsack and how it works. Uh, to to make this uh, system work, we designed a new protocol, Lisa protocol, that is based on MPEG standard over uh, TS. Uh, this allows us to freely transfer any types of binary files through a TS stream. Uh, so we use a TS null packet, and without manipulating the TS header, we inject our data to the payload of the TS packet. On the other side, a user satellite receiver treat the received packets as res regular TS packets and therefore they can they can record it on a usb flash drive for further use uh, that that recorded file then we can we can take it to a computer or a cell phone uh, to be extracted uh, to achieve this we designed the file we designed the file system we call it Lee cluster uh, that can contain two types of the uh, two types of payloads uh, Lee packets and Lee info i will i will explain each one of them in a little bit uh, before that, uh, the Lisa has another specification, which is a, a error correction, a dynamic error correction. We use the scheme similar to RAID zero for our packet leak recovery. Uh, obviously, because the the data is transferred and streamed through satellite, we have some packet losses because of that. Is that that uh, the nature of satellites? And uh, on top of that, uh, in some areas that this system would work similar to Iran. Government use different techniques of jamming uh, on on satellite TV channels. Uh, so we need we needed to uh, count for that, and because of that we added this uh, dynamic error correction. And in the past four years, it allowed us to have consistent uh, consistent stream of data to Iran, even though we experienced uh, severe jamming uh, at some points. Uh, but I talked about Lee cluster. Lee cluster uh, is the data type that uh, we designed, uh, so we can we can transfer data through TS packets. Each each TS packet is 188 bytes. That four bytes of it is the TS header. We don't touch the TS header, so the receiver uh, think that it's still re receiving a regular TS that contains either audio, video, or or a mix of both. So what we do, we uh, we extract the payload, in, inject our own payload. Uh, we, we design for that we designed two types of payloads uh, lee packet and lee info lee packets are uh, actually the chunks of files uh, that uh, we transfer through ts uh, these chunks of files are 181 uh, one bytes and uh, we define them in the lee packet header uh, if it's a lee info or it's a, a lee packet uh, but to do so, uh, we designed another uh, file type, uh, which is Lee info that holds all the metadata of all the clusters. Uh, it, it helps the extractor to find each part of each file from the stream. Uh, Lee infos are repetitively sent uh, in the middle of the Lee packets to make sure that a user can extract only a fragment of the stream without having to record the entire packets. Uh, this design also uh, provided us some flexibilities. Uh, since we send our bundles in 24 hour cycles, uh, at each, and each packet is between around two to four hours, uh, takes between two to four hours to be transferred entirely. A user can record at any given moment. And as long as they record for that time, they can receive the, the whole package. Or even if they record only a part of the, a fragment of the uh, two to four hours, for example, they record only for 30 minutes, they're gonna receive, they, they're gonna be able to extract the files that have been sent in that 30 minutes. Uh, I know that it might get a little bit confusing. So because of that, we prepared the demo of how the extraction worked and uh, that hopefully that clears up uh, the system a little bit. So this is the recording that we recorded from a satellite. The, this is from our Touche channel that covers MENA and specifically Iran. 
the channel uh, has audio, video, like a regular channel. However, because of the uh, because we wanted to use most of the bandwidth for uh, data transfer, we are not uh, showing any videos. So instead of that, we are having slides on the channel uh, that has information about about Touche, has information about internet censorship, about the content that we are transferring through the, uh, through Touche, and uh, on top of that. Uh, it has four uh, four specific data that that can be used by our users. Uh, the first, uh, if you look at look up here uh, where my mouse is, uh, we have we show four four pieces of data. The first piece is the date that we sent that that bond uh, uh, note. Uh, the second one is the time that they need to record. Uh, the bundle to receive all the files in that. The third line is the <coughs> uh, size of the bundle. And the last line is a counter. That counter, uh, I, I believe it goes from zero to 100 uh, in minutes and uh, seconds. Uh, so it, it shows for a user, for example, if a user starts recording at, uh, this one is 84, uh, 84 minutes and five seconds. So if they start from here, they need to wait until the counter comes back to this number. So it shows that they received the whole, uh, the whole package. But what can we do with that? And in, in another layer of the TS, there is, there is our data. Uh, so uh, to use that data, we designed the uh, extractor application that uh, can extract that file. Right now, uh, uh, on, on this demo, we had the files on a, uh, on a local storage, uh, but uh, usually people have them on uh, USB flash drives. And if they connect USB flash drives, they can do all these parts of uh, finding the TS file and so on, may make that automatic. They don't, they don't need to do anything. They only need to press extract and it just starts extracting all the files from the TS stream. So the extraction takes a little bit of time. Uh, currently, we have the, the this extractor for uh, Windows and Android, uh, and we have a light version of the extractor uh, for for uh, users that they don't they don't want to use uh, all the features that I'm going to talk about, uh, and they only want to use the uh, extractor itself. So it extracts all the files. We can see the files inside the extractor, or they can browse them just like folders. Uh, files are including softwares. For example, here we have uh, all the anti-filters. Uh, we regularly, on a, on a daily basis, we send the uh, updates to all the anti-filters that are either are active in Iran. Uh, we have tutorials, audios, videos, movies, books, uh, and uh, almost all types of files that that anybody might need. On top of that, we developed an application, a site grabber application that uh, make uh, uh, offline replicate of websites that are censored and filtered in Iran, such as BBC Persian, and send them through, uh, through this application to, to our users. So they can browse it like they're using internet, but all these websites are locally hosted. They are completely offline and they can easily share it with other people as well. Uh, another feature of this uh, site grabber is that uh, they can uh, they can actually uh, if they want they can they can download these packages from internet too. So they are they are not too big of a package. So the main use case of it was was making sure that everybody can access these these websites uh, on demand uh, either through internet uh, or uh, if they want uh, to receive it through satellite they can record it, they can record from satellite and extract it. <clears throat> Another feature of this extractor application is that they can share the files and they can share the application through uh, local, their local network. Uh, this is a new feature we added. We are still testing it, uh, but we try to make it also as easy as possible. So we added the QR code that uh, anybody can use their phones to scan it and they are on the same Wi-Fi and they can uh, access the application based on the uh, accessibility that the, the admin provides them. For example, they can access, uh, they have, can have full access to the, to the whole extractor or they can only see the files without being able to modify them. And if you go, we go to that link, it is the exact same UI of the application and they can do almost 
everything that they were doing locally, they, they can do it now uh, over the, over the uh, network. So, uh, I talked about Tusha channel, I didn't really introduce it. So, uh, currently our main use case of Knapsack is for Iran over Tusha TV channel on Yasat satellite. Yasat is a popular FTA satellite company that hosts, uh, that hosts many Persian language channels for Iran and Afghanistan. And because of that, a significant number of uh, households uh, in both countries have these antennas pointed to Yasat. Uh, so based on our based on the estimates, uh, between 70 to 90 percent of the households in Iran use satellite TVs, despite the fact that satellite equipment is illegal in the country. So it provides us a really really good opportunity to reach anybody who is interested in free and uncensored uh, data and information. Uh, currently, uh, based on the polls that uh, that ran that ran by several independent groups, more than 5 million people have used Tusha in Iran. And a large number of them are residing in, uh, in, uh, in areas uh, that they don't either have internet access or uh, they don't have sufficient internet access, like remote areas. Uh, but the full potential of Tusha was revealed during the 2018 internet shutdown in Iran. Uh, due to the protest, uh, Iran's government first throttled the internet, then we had uh, we experienced internet shutdown, and because of that, we saw a huge number of people started using Tusha to receive data, to receive uh, uh, news, and uh, uh, to to ac actually access information. Uh, we also we experienced a higher than normal jamming on the channel. Uh, but we could maintain the error correction in a way that uh, we ensured all our users can receive all the files efficiently. Uh, in the past four years, we sent over five terabytes of uh, digital content, including educational courses, Wikipedia, ebooks, offline websites, anti censorship applications, and more. Uh, and consequently, we saved millions of dollars in bandwidth and VPN costs for our users. Uh, currently, Touche is actively working with more than 200 publishers uh, that both include mainstream pub producers such as BBC and Re Radio Free Europe and small publishers and small organizations that are active in that area. Uh, Touche was the reason we started this project. But that is definitely not the only use case of this system. Uh, we can use Knapsack in cases such as emergency response and post-conflict rehabilitation, uh, refugee camps, remote, lo <coughs> sorry, remote locations and uh, offline communities, rural areas uh, with no fixed broadband network, and this list can goes on. Uh, since most of these use cases uh, are, are in areas that we can we can access and we can directly operate, we came up with another configuration for our system. Uh, Knapsack Content Station is a, uh, is, is a local, is a central local server that automatically download content from satellite and make them available through LAN and Wi-Fi. Uh, this setup can be used uh, for educational institutes, healthcare centers, libraries, community centers, among others, and uh, can hold thousands of gigabytes of digital content for on-demand access of that community. Uh, this setup is pretty uh, flexible too. For instance, uh, using this system uh, for a rural school, uh, we can install a, a, a learning management system, a LMS system, and uh, that can improve the learning experience for those students. Uh, while their content is getting updated through satellite uh, and uh, they, they, can, they can benefit from that, that up-to-date information as well. Uh, to test this, this idea, we uh, started a pilot plan and we installed a content station for a school in Oaxaca, Mexico, uh, which is a rural, a rural school. They did not have any access to the internet. Um, and to use this service, students uh, could easily uh, connect to a Wi-Fi uh, that we were providing them uh, and uh, enjoy a variety of content that was uh, once on the server. And also the contents were getting updated as well. Uh, so the, their learning experience completely changed. 
Uh, if you're in North America and you're interested in testing uh, Knapsack, we have a test channel on Galaxy 19. Uh, the frequency is provided here. Um, you can uh, and you can obtain the extractor from our website, Knapsack for Hope. Uh, dot org uh, and see how it works for yourself uh, thank you very much and uh, I would be happy if you have any question to answer your questions thank you thank you very much this this was absolutely fascinating and it's really amazing to see what you've done and it's also so rare to see a project like this that has been working under pretty extreme conditions for, for four, more than four years, serving, serving content to populations that are desperately in, in need of this content. Um, Thank you. I, I, I know I have, a, I have a couple of questions that I wanted to ask, but uh, first, anybody else in the channel? It sounds like Nico had some comments about other types of integrations. Hi, uh, yes, uh, thank you. Uh, thank you for the presentation too, it is very interesting. Uh, I have been, I, I think I met you, uh, the project uh, three years ago at the D-Web Summit, the second one. Anyway, um, uh, I met a few, uh, a week ago with Ilya from webrecorder.io. Uh, there's an interesting, pro it's an interesting project in relation to uh, web archiving and that mm -hmm. it basically proposes to uh, do like uh, what Internet Archive does at a global scale you being able to do it at an at a, at a individual scale and it will be I, I'm curious if you are aware of, uh, of them of the work work format and if you have any plans for integration mainly because the the tooling is very developed so it's uh, some uh, and the experience is very straightforward I, I, I tried it out and you could even you can even um, archive interactive websites with uh, w with uh, no issues at all, like you know, like uh, if, if sites that fetch uh, uh, resources in a uh, in an interactive <coughs> way, the way it, it reproduces them perfectly, even YouTube web, uh, videos. So it's a very interesting technology. And then, of course, uh, as as many of the uh, usual. Uh, attendance to this call. No, I represent the Libre Router project. This uh, mesh network uh, router for for rural communities that can be deployed without any technical knowledge and maintained and expanded. And I think there's uh, some uh, low hanging fruit in in using mesh technologies to expand the reach of uh, of your pods of your of, of your servers to a wider audience uh, by using mesh technology. So I would be really glad to explore that possibility too. Thanks. Uh, thank you very much, Nicole. I believe yeah, we met uh, at DWeb, uh, and uh, yeah, we, I'm in contact with Ilya with Web Recorder. They are doing a fascinating job. Uh, we are in contact with them for a few years, uh, and definitely, I like to to hear more about your project. Uh, if if I can have your email address, if you can put it in the chat, I would be. Uh, I'll send you an email to keep in touch. Definitely, we like to expand uh, expand our system, uh, and uh, using mesh networks is definitely one of the ways to uh, increase the footprint of our uh, uh, content stations. Uh, one thing that that uh, 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 it's necessary, I think, it's necessary to talk about is. Uh, I believe everybody in this community is familiar with uh, projects like uh, Libraries Without Borders. Uh, the the main difference that our system has compared to all of those all those systems is that uh, we can uh, update them on demand. Uh, so, for example, Libraries Without Borders they they provide a system that has a, a, a lot of data, uh, but to update any of those systems, they they need to uh, the person needs to go there and update the, the content uh, themselves. So the, the benefit of using Knapsack compared to those systems is that it can it can be updated uh, without without any human interaction. So once we install the servers, we install the content station, uh, it can get all the updates through satellite uh, without and nobody needs to be there to update this this content. And Nico asked, uh, 
you have some delta update mechanisms. Unfortunately, I don't know what delta update mechanism is. If you can, oh, I mean, uh, I, I, uh, upload downloading just the difference between your last up your last download and your uh, current one. Let's say if you add uh, just one word to <coughs> a document, the difference mm -hmm. between the previous version and the current version is just that word. You download mm -hmm. just that word. No, currently, currently our system is uh, continuously downloading all the content. Uh, the reason is that uh, we are we cannot see the content before we actually extract them. So what what we see is an is a is a uh, regular uh, TS file that has audio and video, and until we start extracting them, we cannot see what's what's in, inside the uh, inside the content. So uh, we can't really benefit from that. And since the mechanism does not uh, does not add any cost uh, to the system, uh, so we we really didn't didn't follow that path. I don't know if I answered your question. Yes, thanks. For sure. And with regard to the Colibri, uh, yeah, we've been in contact with Learning Equality team, <clears throat> and we actually deployed. Colibri on our uh, content station server in our pilot project in Mexico. And yeah, we are looking actually for making the, making Tusha more available for integration with other offline internet, you know, services, including Colibri from the interfaces all the way to internet in a box, you know, uh, having, deploying the system on Android, you know, receivers. So even the extraction would be, you know, done automatically on satellite receivers. So they don't have to go through this process of uh, recording and extraction. So it would be actually, you know, shared, uh, stored, you know, recorded, stored, extracted, stored, and, you know, shared over a Wi-Fi network. So uh, even, you know, the, the average users with very basic knowledge uh, of like, you know, tech literacy, they can use and access the services and, and data. So uh, yeah, I mean, some learning management systems that can operate in an offline uh, situation uh, like Colibri. Yeah, we've been, you know, with other lead engineer and Liz and also uh, Devon uh, to, to explore the ways that we can integrate the services and update it, you know, more frequently rather just, you know, using a sneaker net uh, strategies. I, I had a question, uh, a, a little bit from a maybe less technical, but more on the usability aspect. So I'm curious how you are testing things. Like, like it's very interesting, these flows. I think in, in Western internet world, you have these, these, these blinders on of like the internet just works all the time, right? So you click mm -hmm. the button and the thing happens, right? But these are very like disconnected user interaction flows where you have a television and you have television hardware and then you have a USB key and then you take the USB drive and then you load that into other external systems that you use for content consumption, curriculum, Wikipedia, viewing videos, things like this. Uh, have, you, have you worked, do you have a design team at Net Freedom Pioneers and have you worked and done user testing and uh, user research into how, how these flows work and where people fall off in these flows? Are these flows very natural and normal for the type of audiences you're, you're working directly with? Uh, actually, at the beginning, the flow is not, is not natural because everybody used satellite receivers for, for, uh, record, for only watching TV. Uh, I, actually, that was, that was a struggle that we had to get people to actually try it once and see that it's a trivial uh, flow. They don't really need to do anything specific like recording their favorite show they can record from our channel and then connect the USB flash drive to their computer and extract files. Uh, it sounds bizarre. <laughs> I, I know that it sounds bizarre. Uh, but uh, one thing that we learned was that in a case like Iran, the best way to, uh, because we cannot go there. We cannot have anybody directly there. Uh, we have uh, uh, we have people that they report to us. They report uh, the, the, their usage, uh, or if if something goes wrong or our signal is not uh, uh, as a strong, they let us know. Or if there is jamming, they let us know. But uh, obviously, we can't go there. So uh, we found out that the best way uh, to promote this system and tell people how easy they can access free and reliable information is uh, that somebody that has already used it 
tell someone else and show them and show them once that okay you just need to record and extract it's a like one to two a step really trivial you don't need to have any knowledge you don't, or you don't need to make any modification and uh, so that was that was a struggle that's a still a struggle uh, but thankfully uh, in the past four years we we made a really good user base uh, that they're really interested in receiving all the content and uh, me myself if somebody when i was in iran i, I moved moved out of iran eight nine years ago if someone uh, back then was offering me two to four gigabytes of data on a daily basis i would go around and tell everybody you can start that using that too so we found that 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 solution is the best solution for us uh, but other than that we are using social media to tell people uh, we use our slides that we have on the channel uh, to show them how they can they can extract files uh, and the it, it becomes pretty easy for them after one after one time that they, they go through this process. That's why for outside of Iran, for users like schools, uh, community centers, and places that we can have it, we can have a central uh, 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 content station. We came up with that content station idea that uh, they don't need to be worried about recording or extracting files. The files would be available, and it would be like just like internet, but in in in, in, a, in a smaller scale. And they can browse files over. And the other point that I want to add is uh, with the extractor, some users, you know, when they are using that, you know, they, they could be online, we could actually collect some information, but due to the situation in Iran and, you know, our, our uh, policy of having a privacy built in, in our system, we don't collect any information of the users, like you know, how, many, how many times you know, they're extracting the information or what files are they exploring, you know, where in the app they are like, you know, uh, engaging more often. So that would make our job easier, at least you know, with, the, with the users that are connected to the internet. So we could collect the information, but we rather not to, you know, to, to keep them uh, more protected, yeah. Uh, th thank you very much for that for that last point because I think it's really really important. Uh, even in value aligned software in the West, where people would rather not be tracked, a lot of those product development organizations say, "But we need to know whether our software is working or not, <laughs> so we have to collect the telemetry, and we only use Google Analytics to do that part, and it's mostly anonymous." But still, people, it's, it's in your situation is a very good example of when it's better to be safe, and you put the user first by not collecting that data in, the, in that matter. So I, I really appreciate that. Uh, one of the other questions that I had was around DNS. Uh, you know, these are the type, like, like Arky's talk two, two sessions ago, he was like in refugee camps where he's trying to provide content. DNS is the biggest, biggest challenge and the biggest barrier for him to be able to get content to actually work offline. Uh, in your site grabber tool, how have you worked around that? Have you, have you either chosen content that works specifically that way already, or have you done hacks and things like that to be able to spoof DNS or things like that? How have you gotten over the, the DNS hurdle? Uh, so uh, the, 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 offline, the, the site grabber, uh, it doesn't, uh, they cannot really browse uh, in, in, in that sense. So they cannot browse like the archive. So uh, how they can access the websites is actually they go there and click on them. So if you, even if you go in the, inside the folders, you're gonna see an index file for each, each one of those websites and a bunch of folders and files that are, the, the, that are for example, we record them up to three, three layers. Uh, so we, we were not dealing with the DNS uh, because the solution that we wanted to offer was more accessibility again and easy ease of share. So anybody who wants to share the files right now or share the news specifically, uh, they can easily grab that one HTML and send it to anybody else. Uh, that was the whole idea behind the site grabber. And that's why, for example, in our site grabber, we remove all the interactive features of all the websites. So they are uh, uh, literally takes that uh, image. So that's actually the root of my question, I think, was like, what type of preparation or processing did you do in SiteGrabber to be able to make sure that this content is functional offline? It is, it is entirely, it's a flat HTML, uh, CSS, and it's only HTML, CSS, and images. That's it. Okay, great. Thank you. For sure. Any other um, questions that people have? Yeah, Yanis. Um, yeah, I have a quick question. So you have 
put together a new kind of uh, bucket type, right? Um, sure. Can you share some insight as to, you know, what drove specific design decisions or if you have, uh, if you had any challenges in terms of interoperability um, with, you know, running um, and transporting basically these product, these, uh, these data frames over, you know, conventional networks? Mm -hmm. uh, so from packet size and packet fragmentation to whatever other thing. Uh, the, the, Pro, the decision making process and uh, I wasn't there uh, and uh, I'm not sure if I'm the best person to uh, explain that. Uh, I can connect you to, to our uh, lead engineer uh, if you want more in-depth uh, information about the, the process that they, they uh, that led to uh, this design. But uh, what I know is that uh, we explored different different configurations, for example, uh, we explored that uh, we don't have any audio and video and we just transfer data, but we ran into trouble uh, because the receivers were not recorded because they couldn't encode, decode uh, the channel at all. Uh, they were dropping all the packets. So what we came up at the end of the day with is that uh, we, usually when we get a channel, we have one video channel and two audio channels. Uh, we have a slice on one on the video channel that uh, 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 an audio uh, uh, stream on the audio, the first audio channel. On, on the second audio channel, uh, we put the files, we put the content, we put the TS that are containing our files. Uh, and because the first two are recognizable for the receiver and they can actually play it and show it on a TV, they, when they record the, the channel, the TS would be recorded entirely. So all three layers would be recorded and makes us able to extract the files uh, uh, from, from, that, from that package. I know that that was one of the challenges they were facing. Uh, and uh, they, were, they, they tested it with different types of uh, MPEG, uh, but I believe MPEG2 was the best solution for us because it was providing us with a, a null packet in, in their design. Uh, and that null packet helped us a lot. Uh, we, as I said, uh, we use that null packet that we, we so we don't uh, touch the header, and we only touch the we only inject the data to the payload. So later on, our Linfo has the has the sequence number of each one of these packets that are containing our information, and they can use they can grab it from each one of them. Um, and co collect them all together to uh, remake the files that we are uh, that we sent at the at the first place. Oh, very useful. Yeah, thanks. Sure. Uh, and as so, I said, if sorry. Oh, no, go ahead. Uh, as as I said, uh, if you need more information, um, uh, I can I can refer you to our lead engineer. Uh, he definitely can uh, help you more in depth with the technical part of the design. Cool. No, that was very helpful. Thanks. For sure. Uh, I have another question. Well, a, a few comments, actually. Um, uh, the, qu the first question is related to airtime. So if you're using 100% of your available airtime or you're using low, less than 100%, and if you're using less than 100% of it, uh, if you're using any strategy for... Um, Specifically for uh, like er error correction, the not error mm -hmm. correction, error. Uh, so redundancy, uh, information okay. redundancy. Uh, so there are some some strategies related to uh, you send uh, uh, let's say ten blocks and six of them, any of the six of them, you can reveal the information. Um, so uh, in these cases where you, you might have a cloud or something that might uh, stop you from fetching a piece of it, uh, it allows you to be able to reveal information even though you haven't got the whole package. And I think it would be very useful. Um, then, and, and two more comments. One is in relation to a, a packaging format that is being cooked, uh, a website packaging format that is being cooked. Uh, that is called web package. Uh, the idea is uh, to be able to uh, have websites that can be packaged in a 
a self-contained uh, format where all of the resources are in there and they are signed so the content can't be tampered but they are not encrypted so let's say the home page of a newspaper uh, the uh, it, it is i mean may, maybe you don't want to uh, so if you fetch it as a an encrypted re uh, request because it's location based you will still be um, exposing that you're accessing that website. So in that sense, you, you don't know which website, you, you, which part of the site you're accessing, but because of its location, you are giving away a lot of information. On the other hand, you don't need, so if the information is public enough, or you, if you don't mind giving away the information that you're sharing, you, there's a lot that you can gain because by being signed, it can be tampered with, but you can cache it, or you can re, uh, you can forward it. For example, you can share it via Bluetooth or via uh, offline mechanisms or peer-to-peer uh, -peer mechanisms without uh, breaking the the information. That would be very useful for your project. And uh, thank you. And then the, sure. Yeah, and then the third the third thing is. There's a project that I have, well, I, I work with community networks around the globe, and there's one uh, very interesting project that is called Group, Group O. Uh, it's a community network in the uh, rural areas of Namibia, uh, uh, around 50 to 60 kilometers from the capital of the, of the country. Uh, and um, uh, this is like a village where they have set up a wireless network and in that village they have very little energy, like no infrastructure um, and the system that they, ha they have created for themselves is there's one person in the village that usually roams from their village to the main city and in the main city this person has access to broadband or like Mm -hmm. very very narrow broadband for our typical use case but broadband for them mm -hmm. uh, so the villagers ask him hey please fetch me something about this topic or, or please search a video about this other topic so this person when he goes to the city he looks around in, on the internet he, fetch, he, he downloads content and when he goes back he hosts them on a raspberry pi in his village and the, the villagers can access this content. Is there any uh, system that you might have in place to do this? I, I know that you, I don't remember if it's with uh, your project or the outer net project, other net project, outer net project. Sorry, I, I get messed up with these two projects. No. <laughs> yeah, uh, that, that there were a way to ask for something. And I don't remember it was a, if it was a spreadsheet on the, on, on, on the web or something like that. Uh, but I'm, yeah, we we can we can we can we get requests from our users. Uh, they can send the request through their, their through their satellite. Obviously, it's a one-way connection. But we 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 are in contact with our users uh, because in Iran, most of the people they have access to the internet, uh, but the internet is not reliable. Uh, so how they they can uh, they they can contact us? They can email us. They can phone call. They can call us. They can send us text messages. They and we are we are uh, available on all social media platforms and uh, uh, like WhatsApp, Telegram, and so on. So they can contact us and we receive uh, hundreds of messages every day, uh, requesting for different types of content. Uh, so we have that channel, but that channel is obviously not through through uh, the infrastructure that we have. It goes again either through uh, the classical telephone and to calling, uh, or it goes through the internet to send us a message. Uh, but because because most of them they have access to to uh, the minimum of internet, they can still send us a text message and ask for for a specific content. Uh, yeah. Okay. There, uh, and, and there's another interesting project right now uh, that might be of use for your, like a complementary use that's called Hermes. It's H-E-R-M-E-S. Uh, it's a, a HF radio uh, network uh, that is using um, 
uh, inexpensive HF equipment, and right now they are migrating to um, software-defined radios, uh, HF radios, creating a network of them to, uh, and it might be a very interesting case for having a, an uplink for you, because it's a very slow but effective way to get a message from very far away to a nearby city. Uh, it is being used in Mexico and in Brazil. Uh, and if you're interested in getting in touch with them, I can uh, also correct you. I'm familiar with uh, Hermes. I don't know Ahmed. I, I'm, I, I'm not, I haven't been in touch with them. I don't know if Ahmed was in touch with them or not. Yeah, uh, with Anna and Rafael. Yeah, we, we've been, you know, uh, in contact with them. Uh, I learned about their project, especially the Amazon project uh, that they are doing, you know, for sending. So, yeah, definitely, especially, you know, their, their challenge was it's a two way, you know, communication. But still, you know, the bandwidth that they have they, and they can tap onto, it's very limited, very limited. But the, the idea is basically, you know, most of the bandwidth are consumed for download, right? Rather just, you know, upload. So they can still like, you know, sending some requests, making some requests. And on the other way back, we can, you know, bundle the content if either automatically or manually and transfer the content over there. Either, you know, it could be shared over a Wi-Fi network similar to an outside content station or the users, they can receive the content, you know, on their own uh, using the satellite, you know, FTA dishes. And uh, the other thing is uh, with, uh, with this uh, uh, content that we are sending is, the, we rather, for example, in Iran and Afghanistan, we rather, it's, it, it covers the whole region. So it's a bit, you know, complicated to, it's a broadcasting, it's not unicasting or multicasting. So the content has to be kind of universal or, you know, if you are sending to a specific person or a specific group, you know, we have some uh, ways to encrypt, you know, part of that bundle. So a specific users, they can only, only uh, use that service. So this way we can, you know, send, a specific information to a specific communities in the Amazon region, you know, if, if they have any, uh, any specific request or demand, which is not relevant to other communities. So, but still it's not the internet, but. <sighs> awesome, thank you very much. And yeah, thanks for the, the pointer to web package, Nico. Uh, I think one of the one of the constraints that we've had, and, and Light also looked a lot through these specifications as well, is that web packaging and some of those some of the related standards have a dependency on the intersection of DNS and SSL and and that infrastructure. And as long as you are dependent on that infrastructure for validation to be able to open it, then you hit these same, same walls again. Um, that, that's one of the reasons why I, IPFS has explored and experimented with things like web packaging and signed HTTP exchanges. But as soon as that dependency on the security model of existing browser and web is in, is present, then our ability to serve these users disappears because they don't have that type of connectivity. It's one of those things where they're like this specification speaks to, especially in its use cases, so many of the things that the projects like Knapsack are doing and, and IPFS and a bunch of related projects. But from the infrastructural standpoint, as long as that dependency on the security model of the web exists, you, you can only get so far. It's really It's really hard. Well, I, I would, I, y yes, but I would say so. Um, so right now, um, most of the computers uh, are distributed, are, are are set up by from a factory or from your from the very moment that you set them up with root uh, certificates uh, installed. So you can rely on those, though it's the mo the, the least the the the, the, the least um, trust worthy like you 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 can't rely as much as any other yeah of course but again uh the the benefit our outcome the the the, the uh, out uh, i don't know how to say it. Uh, the, the, benef the benefits are huge uh if you start using this uh, distribution mechanisms um yeah yeah, I, 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 I agree. It's, it's, just, it's a really hard, it's a really hard problem, right? It's, and uh, one of the things that I think is interesting about this is that it's a specification that affects decision making and technology adoption 
for two, five, 10, 15 years down the road if people adopt yeah. web packaging. And that's, I think that's one of the reasons why for projects like this, I think like I would be very reticent to, to adopt it wholesale because then you have that dependency for the next 10, five, 10, 15 years. Also from a hardware important. standpoint, getting hardware into like the root certificates is something that every single phone manufacturer tweaks when they put hardware into a specific market. So if I am mm. Huawei uh, and I want to get Huawei phones sold in Iran, the, I need Iranian version of, of, of the FCC to approve each one of those root certificates. So there's censorship risk there in dependence on hardware out of the factory. Um, but then I, I think it is like, uh, I, well, this, this might be standing away from the, the conversation, but again, uh, uh, th there are a few other projects that have tried to package the web in a certain way. For example, AMP, the AMP project or Facebook, uh, internet.org or whatever. And it is super important that we get into this conversation uh, and and these are very valid options like this. Well, the web package is one. Uh, the web archiving resource format, uh, uh, the work format. Uh, these are things that uh, and it is on our hands. Like for example, for by 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 by, by them and uh, for us, for example, too, in the, from the uh, community network, from the, from the users' perspective, we need to try out these technologies because it's. At our way to participate in this discussion. If not, we are just leaving the, the conversation for wow. the big players and it's, yeah. I, I think the input is, the, is so important. In this. So like I was going to encourage, one of the reasons why I was thanking you for bringing it up is now I, I wanted to encourage projects like, like Knapsack for Hope to provide the feedback about why a given specification might be not adoptable for them. So you're like a, a write up from Knapsack for Hope on we could not, looking at this web package specification, which is the basically the standardized version of AMP by Google, we could not adopt it for our use case and here is why, is the type of feedback that the standards bodies desperately need. And it affects how they make this, the decision. So I think, I think that's a fantastic point. I, I, I agree completely. Have to be part of the conversation if you want to have the standards that, that, that define our world and the air we breathe for the next decade or two, have them meet our needs and our users' needs. Uh, I remember that we, we tried to use web package uh, about a year ago for our uh, offline versions of website. We ran into trouble and I know that our engineers were in contact with the web package uh, development team. Uh, but eventually they decided that because of the nature of the, the use case of Touche and the fact that we want to make it as easy to use as possible, uh, and the packages as small as possible, uh, they ended up deciding that uh, the best solution for now is to have a flattened uh, HTML file uh, that can be transferred in, in a matter of a few seconds to our users uh, without being worried about, about all the protocols and about all the, the, the specifications of the user system. So uh, we are losing some, some benefits uh, because we, 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 are, we are sending it flat and uh, HTML file. Uh, but on the other hand, we, we are making it easy for everybody in Iran, uh, even with no technical knowledge, uh, to use these web pages to read the news and uh, uh, to, to, to share it easily with everybody else. Yes, tooling is one, one weak point in this sense because it's a very early stage of the protocol. So there are not many tools around for the web package, at least I haven't found many uh, because it's also an exploration. It is different yeah. for, for example, work, the web archiving format, where uh, it is not good for your use case, not the best for your use case because it is basically the TCP, it's like a TCP dump, like a, it's like the exchange of packages at the very level, low level uh, written down in, a, in an archive, in a, in a tar file. Uh, like a, in a in a tar GZ file, so it is uh, difficult to to search. It is difficult to open it, uh, to uh, to process it, uh, and it it brings things that you might not even need. Um, so tailor made HTML would be the best uh, for the bandwidth that you have. But still, it is something that uh, to keep to keep in mind. This is that you're saying. Like we need to be very bandwidth efficient. Then this is not. As it is, it, it doesn't serve our use case. Okay, then what should be added? 
to the uh, to the system, to the system, to the protocol, or to the underlying tools that would effectively solve that problem. So you could use it because the other features might be very valuable for the for 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 the project. And also being part of the conversation is very valuable. Again, we don't usually have time for those things, but uh, it is something to keep in mind. Uh, we're thank we're you. at time for the hour. Uh, I really wanted to thank Aman and Evan for coming today. It's been a fascinating presentation, a great conversation. Uh, thanks everybody for participating. And uh, Giannis is going to take over hosting for our next couple of months. Uh, so we'll have uh, update the issue for this meeting. Uh, if you have suggestions of things, projects you would like to see come and present, please do do suggest and maybe file an issue in the repo. Thanks again, everybody. Thank you. Thank you very much, everybody. Thanks uh, for providing us Thank this opportunity. And also, I shared the link to a Google Drive folder with all the demo and presentation and the softwares and the sample file that you can test it for yourself to ex see how they. Very right, cool. All right. right on. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye. bye.